the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast is back for another episode. Join Mark S. Ryan, a veteran health plan and health technology executive, as he explores the world of healthcare. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. My name is Mark Ryan, and it's a pleasure to be hosting this podcast. And thanks to everyone for listening in. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been doing podcasts on health plan economics. And I want to go back and just refresh you a little bit about the blogs and the podcasts related to health plan economics. So the four-part blog series on health plan economics um, appeared from April 25th to May 6th. You can go to the blog tab at healthcarelabyrinth.com to um, read or reread uh, the health plan economics uh, blog series. I've tried to cover all the elements of those four parts of the blogs in my podcast recently. Back on February 2nd and February 9th, I had podcasts about Medicare Advantage and some of the trends there and the economic impacts. That was really sort of part one of my blog series, but I actually did the podcast earlier, February 2nd and February 9th. The second part of my podcast, health plan economics blog series was about the exchanges and the incredible stability we've seen over the last couple of years. And that aired that podcast on May 10th. The third part of the blog series was about Medicaid and some of the problems we're seeing now with redeterminations. That was last week, that podcast on May 17th. And this week, we are going to sort of try and sum things up, cover a little bit in less depth about earlier podcasts and blog series. This is about healthcare trends and how the trends impact healthcare finances and economics. So let's get right to it. Again, we'll take two breaks. We'll try to divide this up. I think this is going to be a relatively quick podcast, uh, but we'll break it up and we'll take a couple of trends uh, and explain them before each break. So as we start out, let's talk a little bit about enrollment here and some of the enrollment trends we're seeing out there. So number one, enrollment in many ways is everything to a health plan. It's what tends to drive revenue and usually means less risk as the law of large numbers means a healthier profile in general. But that is not always the case, and we're seeing some evidence of that right now, and we'll go a little more into that in a minute. So what are the trends in enrollment? Well, in the Medicare Advantage world, we are seeing huge surges in enrollment. Medicare Advantage is now more than 50% of all Medicare beneficiaries out there, and it tends to be very popular among seniors and those with disabilities who are in Medicare because it brings great value. The benefits within MA are far better than what you see in Medicare fee-for-service, and especially for those on fixed income, it's a great bargain. So we are seeing enrollment surges that are just very demonstrable. Uh, Since January 2020, we've seen so far enrollment surge by more than 40% in MA, We're now well over 51% of enrollees, and we don't see that slowing down. There are some financial pressures that are going on within the industry, but the value, even if benefits change somewhat coming up, the value of MA compared to fee-for-service will likely continue that growth in the program uh, throughout the end of the decade and longer. But at the same time, as I told you, due to some missteps in terms of building up too many benefits over time, we are currently seeing some financial problems and some plans in financial trouble. They sort of over-designed their benefits, thinking their star performance was continued to do well, that rate hikes would continue to be there, and things of that nature. And therefore, higher enrollment, at least right now in the Medicare Advantage world, does not necessarily mean a healthier profile and better margins. In fact, margins are negative right now for some of the plans. Uh, Some of it is not just foolish decision-making by MA plans, but also 
a return of utilization and some regulatory changes as well. But by and large, we are seeing huge growth in MA. Generally, it's a helpful thing to MA, uh, but right now we're seeing some problems due to some poor decision-making leading to very high expenses on a blossoming Medicare Advantage population. In the Medicaid world, we are seeing more of what you typically think about rising and falling enrollment and what impact it has on health plan. We saw Medicaid enrollment surge through about the end of 22 into early 23 because of the COVID flexibilities and the forestalling of the regular Medicaid redetermination process in the program. But since April 23, redeterminations have been back, and that has led to a fairly major drop in the number of people in the program. From its peak, we are down over 10 million lives in the program, and that major shedding of enrollment has essentially meant a sicker cohort or adverse selection for those that are remaining in the plans. And uh, that's a serious problem for Medicaid managed care plans, but in a couple of minutes, I'm gonna tell you how plans overcame that with rate hikes. So again, we're seeing a sicker cohort in Medicaid because enrollment has gone down. In the exchange world, since the Biden administration came to power, we see a major commitment to drive enrollment both enhanced premium subsidies passed by the Biden administration on two occasions, which are temporary through 2025, as well as the shedding of some of that of those Medicaid lives because of the Medicaid redeterminations have really driven enrollment in the exchanges to a record high. We're up over 5 million over a couple of years ago. This has really stabilized the finances in the exchanges. So again, more lives, a better financial picture, low premium hikes, greater plan participation, and better network access. So that's just sort of a quick summary of enrollment trends and the impact on the margins and the economics of health plans. On the employer group coverage side, I will note as an aside here, that uh, employer group coverage is clearly the mainstay of American healthcare. It has weathered the COVID pandemic storm fairly well. It's been remarkably stable, profitable, and resilient. Uh, so that has been a bright sign. And enrollment has, you know, been roughly the same and growing within the employer group coverage sector the last couple of years. Our second topic is really rate hikes. So on the rate hike front, I note in the Medicare Advantage world that we saw pretty hefty rate increases at the beginning of the decade through, say, 2023. But in 2024 and 2025, we've seen some low or negative rate hikes, depending on who you believe and what you count. And we will continue to see in 26 probably that low or negative rate hikes as well. And that's largely due to the uh, adoption of a new risk model uh, within Medicare Advantage that will take out about 7% of revenue from the base with some of the reforms related to risk adjustment. And that in part is creating some of the those financial woes for MA plans combined with poor star scores, which tend to drive revenue too. So low rate hikes, poor star scores, are contributing on the revenue side to those financial woes. We know again that that rate problem will continue at least through 2026 due to that rollout of a controversial risk adjustment formula change. On the flip side, as I alluded to earlier on the enrollment front, Medicaid managed care plans were very savvy and lobbied for rate hikes. Uh, as the sicker cohort became obvious, as Medicaid lives dropped out, uh, the Medicaid managed care plan successfully got many state Medicaid agencies to give them interim rate increases or heftier um, annual rate increases, and that has softened the blow in terms of the loss of revenue from enrollment. So that has been a great financial stabilizer for them as well.
So that's a little bit on rate hikes. Uh, let's move on to utilization and inflation here. What we're seeing here is a general return of um, historic medical utilization in healthcare. And this is driving increases in medical expense. In addition, we're also seeing some moderately aggressive inflation and the continuing rise of drug prices. The combination of the return of medical utilization post-COVID, as well as the moderately aggressive inflation, is leading to increases in what are known as the medical loss ratios, which is the percentage of overall premium that is spent on medical expense. Now, in the MA world, you generally would say that a healthy MLR is somewhere in that low to mid 80s. Um, however, more recently, in recent quarters, we have seen Medicare Advantage medical loss ratios due to some of the things we've talked about earlier, rising to the high 80s, even into the low 90s. So that's a big worry in the MA plan world. Medicaid plans, because of the lower reimbursement levels for health plans, generally see MLRs in the high 80s or the low 90s. Because of those rate increases that I've talked about right now, those interim and healthy rate increases that were sought and obtained by plans in many states have allowed those Medicaid plans to buck even higher MLRs. So they're sort of holding steady. Exchange plans and employer groups, of course, build inflation into their rates to the public and employers. Uh, these have been reasonable thus far, but premiums could increase in the future due to this medical utilization return, as well as the moderately aggressive inflation we're seeing. So that's just a quick recap of three trends there, enrollment, rate hikes, and utilization inflation. We'll take our first break now, and when we come back, we'll continue listing out the healthcare trends and the impact on finance and economics at health plans. The Healthcare Labyrinth is no ordinary website. It features news and commentary from one of the nation's leading healthcare policy and technology experts. Mark Ryan combs the internet for the latest healthcare news and publishes a news feed each weekday with summations and Mark's insights. Twice a week, Mark publishes a blog to go deep into a current issue. And of course, Mark hosts a podcast each week to delve even further. All of this is available at healthcarelabyrinth.com. Visit each day for the latest happenings in healthcare. As well, learn more about Mark's book, The Healthcare Labyrinth, at the website. That's healthcarelabyrinth.com, your go-to source for healthcare news. Welcome back. We hope you're enjoying this podcast related to health plan economics, and we're talking about healthcare trends. We'll move on to our fourth area here, and we'll talk a little bit about quality focus in these areas and the impact on on finances and economics as well. I referred to some of this earlier. So there is a huge quality focus occurring in the Medicaid worlds. The Medicare Advantage STAR program continues to mature and MA plans are struggling to keep up as I referenced. Well less than half of all MA contracts now receive four STAR or greater ratings. And four, four and a half and five are what's known as quality plans eligible for that 5% quality bonus. And again, well less than half of plans now have seen that in 2024. It's really a problem for plans big and small. And because the rate setting structure as well as the quality bonus is tied to what you're rated from a quality perspective, this is a huge limiting factor on plans if you don't get to four star or greater. And so if you're not getting the bonuses or high ratings, it's a major impact on revenue and competitiveness. And when you combine it with low rate hikes, it starts to create on the revenue side, huge financial problems. The trend will only become worse as we see stricter measures and what's gonna be the new health equity index that is introduced in uh, 2027. 
In fact, some of the benchmarks for the performance in 2027 is actually being collected in the 2024 measurement year. So uh, it's almost here. And so we see a star MA picture that is going to get worse and worse, and that could significantly hobble the performance and the competitiveness of plans moving forward. Um, Medicaid is set to go on a star quality journey as well. Way back in the Obama administration, something called the Medicaid mega rule was passed, and it basically indicated that a quality program had to occur. And so, as usual, bureaucracy takes a long time to initiate. And so we're now finally seeing CMS actually in the most recent Medicaid rule pushing forward on laying out a very fine blueprint for all states to adopt the Starlight Quality Bonus Program. And so this will take some more years to mature, but this will begin to shape revenue pictures for Medicaid managed care plans as well. It's thought that these STAR measures will be fairly rigorous like they are in Medicare. That could mean uh, fines and penalties to health plans. And over time, we'll also start to see quality bonus programs as well emerge in Medicaid. In fact, these are already in some states. They've been there for decades, as in the case of the QAR program in New York. But this will become a nationwide requirement, and that will have major financial and competitiveness implications for Medicaid managed care in the future. And given just generally the historic issues with quality in the Medicaid program, you know, you have to assume that many plans will be struggling here. The exchanges, too, will grow into a star quality program over time. Initially, CMS didn't want to go too fast on this because there was a lot of financial instability in the exchange marketplace. But you will begin to see them now that there is stability to really push more on the star quality front as well. And I would also notice as an aside that employers increasingly are asking health plans uh, for improved quality performance too. So we're starting to see that in the employer world along the way. Let's next talk a little bit about regulatory mandates and how this impacts health plans as well. Well, regulatory mandates can impact revenue depending on um, what that mandate is, but more importantly, it can certainly impact administrative costs along the way. It's also true that while a regulatory mandate could potentially have long-term savings implications, in the short term, it could also uh, impact administrative costs considerably. So there are regulatory changes galore throughout healthcare, I will tell you. Uh, one of the big areas is new interoperability mandates that tend to go across most lines of business. And this will require plans to invest heavily in data exchanges to member apps, to other plans, and eventually between payers and providers. Well, this has great potential, again, to streamline and lower costs. Again, in the short term, it means greater expense. With interoperability also comes mandates to process prior authorizations more quickly and stand up electronic submission processes. Again, these are good things, but the truth is that the adoption of electronic processes will take a number of years, and yet regulators are dictating swifter prior authorization timeframes much earlier. So that will serve as a major challenge to plans on the administrative cost front. I will also note that another big regulatory mandate, people don't tend to think of it this way, but it certainly is a mandate, is the National Committee for Quality Assurance, NCQA, which is essentially the national private quality regulator, is also retiring so-called manual chart chasing for what are known as hybrid HEDIS quality measures in favor of integration with electronic medical record systems, it's sort of part of that overall interoperability play. But the fear here is, is that it will take a long time for this to mature and that this could actually lead to lower quality scores and potentially revenue. 
unless plans are really ready for that conversion. And even if they are, we may not find that to be the case on the provider side. So that could create some revenue challenges as well. I would also note that if uh, NCQA is retiring, chart chasing for quality measures, my guess is that regulators will also stop the manual chart submission processes for risk adjustment in MA over time. And this could mean a huge revenue impact unless plans find different ways to get that same information from uh, EMR systems at provider offices if they cannot manually submit it through manual chart submission. So uh, that has not come out yet, but that's just my supposition on a future mandate. There are a series of other MA and Medicaid regulatory changes that have been passed, including Medicare, Medicaid integration, network adequacy and wait times, risk adjustment, transparency and reporting. There have been a slew of prior authorization changes, including timeframes and restrictions in Medicare Advantage in terms of how much prior authorization can be done and other accountability measures. So this certainly creates administrative overhead and a lot of risk for both Medicare and Medicaid plans. So with that, Let's take our remaining break, and when we come back, we'll end with the last few trends on their impact on health plan finances and economics. Health plans and insurance are confusing. Our healthcare system is in dire need of reform. Health policy expert Mark Ryan tackles both issues in his book, The Healthcare Labyrinth. It is both a guide to navigating health plans and fixing American health insurance. Mark dives deep into how health plans and the American health insurance system operate. He then outlines a comprehensive reform agenda for the system as a whole, including pricing, emphasizing health and care management, and ensuring affordable access to health coverage and a private delivery model. Mark is a bit of an unconventional Republican in that he believes affordable access is the morally right thing to do, and that it is also fiscally prudent for our nation. Learn more about Mark's book, The Healthcare Labyrinth, at healthcarelabyrinth.com or search at leading bookseller websites. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook forms. Welcome back. Um, we're going to sum up here with, I think, three remaining trends here that we'll talk about. So, first, very quickly, I wanted to talk a little bit about price transparency. I did review this in another podcast, and I would note that it is a huge priority for both the Trump and the Biden administrations. It's something they saw eye to eye on. And there's no reason to believe that no matter who is president in 2025, that this will change. Hospitals and health plans have been forced to make public rates with each other for several years now. While the rule is not perfect and it needs to be further refined and matured, The postings reveal so much of what is wrong with our system in the United States. There's a great disparity of rates between regions and even within regions. One plan may be paying a hospital one rate. That same hospital may be paid demonstrably more by another plan. Price transparency can eventually, in my view, lower price and bring about what's known as site-neutral payment policies. Site-neutral payments are where the same service is reimbursed the same across all the places of services or sites of care, whether that's an outpatient hospital or an ambulatory surgery center or even a physician office setting. And I believe this is one key to bringing overall costs down. Now, the hospitals certainly fight this um, because they want to retain as much revenue as possible, but it's clear that customers, patients suffer with higher cost sharing, and the system as a whole are burdened with outside neutral payments. And I think in general, price transparency will be one part of a maturation over time to true price reform. My goal is to get to uniform regional pricing out there so that health plans are competing on customer satisfaction and quality. That may take a very long time. But nonetheless, price transparency is a huge 
uh, part of getting to some type of price reform end goal. I would also note that antitrust and competitiveness could certainly impact health plans and providers out there as well. I give a lot of credit to the Biden administration about this. It has made antitrust and competitiveness in healthcare a major focus, and I think this is long overdue. And I would note that this is now, because of Biden's focus, becoming a top priority for lawmakers in Congress on both sides of the aisle. I think philosophically, each of them sees something uh, in this massive consolidation that is occurring not only in health plans, but also among hospitals and providers and things like that. Horizontal integration, where payers combine or providers combine, and vertical integration is where the combination of payers and providers occur. Both have driven price up and really not led to increased quality. The acquisition of providers by hospitals has changed practice patterns to higher cost hospital-owned settings. Private equity investments in both hospitals and provider groups really need to be examined for how much is being taken out in margin and its impact on the quality of care and the service that patients receive. There's no question in my mind that consolidation drives costs up throughout the system. And I think this is something that plans and providers are going to have to grapple with. I think you will begin to see a slowdown in many uh, consolidations out there, whether it's horizontal or vertical. I think this scrutiny that is going to be occurring is a good thing and it should slow some things down. And I think overall, that's a very good thing. I will also note that the change healthcare cyber attack will also have massive impact on the way consolidations are looked at and occur. And so the combination of the antitrust look as well as change healthcare cyber attack, I think ultimately will slow things down. And I think the healthcare system is better off because of that. I'm going to close here on drug pricing. And I would note that retail, specialty, and medical drugs are taking a bigger and bigger share of the healthcare pie. Uh, on one hand, uh, drug treatment can be very cost effective and help save in other areas. But I would also note that unfettered drug pricing is leading to leaps in healthcare costs and premiums. This can especially be seen, for example, in the Medicare program where new drugs, for example, and the high cost of them actually have the potential to impact Part B premiums heavily. And that's a big concern for seniors and the disabled in the program from year to year. President Biden won approval of Medicare drug price negotiations for up to 60 Part D and Part B drugs over time. The pricing in the first 10 is in flight and would take effect in 2026. Drug makers are challenging the law, but so far the Biden administration has really won every round in court. So it doesn't look like uh, drug makers are going to successfully squash uh, the, uh, the law. In addition, a new law also caps the amount of inflationary increases drugs can have, and it returns excess increases as rebates to the federal government and Medicare, as well as reduces Medicare beneficiary cost sharing. The Trump administration, interestingly, once proposed drug price setting against other nations of the world for Part B drugs and Medicare. So as I've said in other blogs and podcasts, in some strange way, Donald Trump and Joe Biden seem more alike on drug pricing than you would ever have imagined, which is very interesting from a policy sense. We know that American drug prices are materially greater than other developed countries, and as prices continue to increase, it means drugs take up more and more of the American healthcare pie. Year-to-year -year increases in drugs now rival increases seen at hospitals, which has always been the granddaddy of inflationary parts of the healthcare system. So drug price control could dominate any new presidential administration, no matter who it is, and it might actually successfully curb overall drug costs. 
Capitol Hill is also very interested in reining in the behavior of pharmacy benefit managers. In some ways, I feel like uh, the pointing toward PBMs alone is unfair in that the drug makers need much greater scrutiny because they are the biggest problem in the pricing system. But nonetheless, PBMs will likely see banning of spread pricing, greater transparency for rebates, potentially passing rebates through at the point of sale, and other efforts to promote the uptake of biosimilars uh, against more expensive brand biologics. So all those things could happen to and impact overall costs and therefore the economics of health plans. I would also mention that uh, there is this proliferation of GLP-1 weight loss drugs. Now, many of those drugs are used for um, disease states, um, uh, keeping disease states in check, for example, diabetes or cardiovascular disease. But more and more, especially in the employer coverage world, GLP-1 drugs are also being used for general weight loss. We know that these are uh, hugely costly, well over $1,000 a month in, in most cases. And while a case can be made that their reasonable use uh, for disease state treatment is a good thing, that GLP-1 drugs could proliferate and cause huge cost problems. We know that the CBO, for example, has failed to find offsetting savings to the use of GLP-1 drugs uh, in at least the first decade or so of, of their use. So uh, this could add demonstrably a cost if uh, costs continue to proliferate. We know in the employer group world that rules are a little more liberal and employers tend to allow more liberal use of drugs. So GLP-1s appear to be um, you know, being adopted at a much greater rate for both disease states as well as for those that are simply overweight or obese. But even in the Medicare world, as an example, the expanded use of GLP-1s to different disease states like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and it's expected that there will be further FDA approvals, could uh, push these GLP-1 drugs to the very top of overall Part D drug spending, which could again create huge financial problems for plans and the systems as a, as a whole. And it could mean um, you know, less benefits, for example, over time in other areas for members in Medicare as well. So uh, this is a huge trend that certainly needs to be watched along the way. With that, um, we're going to conclude this podcast. We hope you enjoyed just running through all of the healthcare trends out there and their impact on finances and economics of health plans and the system as a whole. And we'll see you on the next Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. Take care. Thanks for joining Mark and the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. Go to healthcarelabyrinth.com each day for the latest healthcare news. See you next week on the next Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. Thank you.